I just thought it was something I should tell you. Uh, and I'm very happy uh, to be here today with a, a very, very special guest, uh, Abhishek Pudar, uh, one of the most uh, known, respected, and uh, I would think long leg le legacies in, in, in India. Uh, I don't know of anybody that I mentioned the family name and doesn't know who you are. Uh, and I will, uh, before I will uh, quickly uh, read um, his very impressive bio and what he's doing in the art world, which is what we'll be talking about here today. I would like to thank my good friend, uh, Primala uh, Masen. I, I, I hope she's with us right now. Uh, one of the most professional art uh, professionals um, uh, and, and, and advisors that I know and I worked with for many, many years. And she's on our steering committee at the London conference for many years doing our art uh, our panel. So I, I, uh, I would like to thank her for introducing me to you. Thank you, Danny. Uh, so uh, uh, a little bit about uh, uh, Abhishek. He's a prominent collector and patron of the arts in India. He has been collecting art since high school and has created a significant collection of South Asian art. You know, I should connect you to Crow, uh, one of the biggest families in Dallas that I did a session with and I was at his house. Uh, at his estate in Dallas, and he showed me their collection of fine Asian art. So you will have a lot to talk about. Craft and antiques, including modern and contemporary art and photography. He is the force behind the upcoming Museum of Art and Photography, MAP, uh, in Bengaluru, where he serves as a trustee and to which he donates the initial leadership gift and a substantial portion of the family's art collection. Um, and I have to say, uh, soon we'll see how passionate you are about it. Uh, I remember in our, at our previous calls, you always got to the point of how do we tell the story of the museum. Um, and uh, besides serving on various boards and committees in India, Podar also serves on the advisory committees of the India Europe Foundation uh, for New Dialogues, headquartered in Rome, and on the Lincoln Center Global Advisory Council. He was named as one of Asia's 2018 Heroes of Philanthropy by Forbes magazine. So I'm very, very much honored to have you here with us and uh, good evening. Good evening. Thank you for having me, Danny. Thank you for being here. Um, and uh, perhaps um, I'll start by asking maybe a very general question uh, before we dive into a little bit more about you for the few who don't uh, are not familiar with your uh, with the family legacy. Before that, maybe just to hear from you, how are things with COVID in India now? Uh, what's going on? It was it was uh, uh, horrible several months ago. I remember I was speaking to my friends in India. I spoke to uh, Munjal family uh, that you know uh, the CIO. Uh, uh, it was horrifying. I think we spoke with tears in his eyes and. We were all praying. I wanted to know how things are now and uh, here for Thank you. you, Danny. Things are a lot better in India. Things are seeming like they are getting quite normal. People are going about their work uh, with a lot more gusto right now. Everybody is careful, at least in the cities, they're wearing their masks. Protocols are still in place, but it seems to be business as usual. And I must say off late, the government's doing a brilliant job with the vaccination. And it's not just in urban India, but also in rural India. So the, our numbers are quite under control and uh, we aren't having too many cases of hospitalization. So people are going about life as if COVID is something that they've gotten under control. Good, well, we're looking forward to uh open the world, obviously, in my space, it is the conference world. Um, and then I would like to talk a little bit about your background. I mean, again, uh, uh, anybody who's coming from uh, uh, your part of the world uh, doesn't need any explanations, but maybe a little bit more uh, for our uh, uh, folks from North America, a little bit about your background. I know the legacy goes many years back. So if you can tell us a little bit about the Pudar family. Yeah, so our family is originally from Rajasthan, Denny. And I think uh, a branch of the family moved down to Calcutta in Eastern India 
about 140 or 150 years ago, around the 1880s. We still kept our roots back in Rajasthan, but I think um, pretty much we stopped going there from about the last 60, 70 years, although the ancestral home still exists over there. Finally, the other day, I found a book which had traced our family history, and I was, I think, the 34th generation in that. Wow. So I do not know how accurate that is. I do not know when it was done, but uh, it does exist. Um, yeah, so we it's a family originally from Rajasthan, did a fair amount of business in Calcutta. I, me and my branch of the family, along with my dad, we moved to Bangalore about 30 years ago. And what is the family's business? Where, where did that come from? How did that evolve? And, and what's your role there as well? Uh, so traditionally, I think as was a trading community and a trading um, family as well. Uh, industries, I think, came into the family around the 1960s. And it was fairly diversified. It was a large joint family with interests in steel, in real estate, in jute, in um, plastics, in tea, in explosives. So a variety of different things. And what is your current role in the, in the firm today? So uh, the businesses today that uh, we run is basically tea and explosives for the mining industry. Uh -huh. Got interesting. Um, and uh, what, what is the name of the business? So the tea company is called Matheson Bosanke Enterprises. It was an English company with a managing agency in India, which after the British left my family bought and the estates that went with it and the explosives is under Sua explosives and accessories. Interesting. Well, great. Explosives and tea went well, very well together several, um, you know, in the past when they had some boycotts going on. Um, well, it's tea and tea and tea, so they're very well connected. <laughs> oh, that's right. So, um, uh, and um, maybe before we dive into art, you know, just uh, speak about a little bit of what does uh, wealth mean to you? You grew up in a, in, in a very comfortable prominent family in India. Um, um, a little bit about that. What does that mean to you? What are you doing with, with that? Because I know you've been contributing much to many causes as well. So Denny, I think uh, from the very beginning, we, uh, we were fortunate to be born in luxury and one hasn't seen any hardships whatsoever. But I think the family had a very uh, uh, rooted sense in what does wealth mean? And it wasn't to take it for granted. Uh, we weren't lacking in anything, but it didn't necessarily mean that whatever we wanted, we got. The value of money was always instilled when we were children. And uh, we were never wasteful about it. We weren't allowed to be wasteful about it or spend it in a thrifty manner. Uh, I think it was always told to us that we are only custodians of this. And, and there were two parts to it. One is for the family going forward and the other one was for society. And um, I remember ever since a child, 10% of the family's profit every year was devoted to charity. So I think doing good, not just for oneself, but even for the community and giving back was always a very integral part of our upbringing. Very nice. Uh, now, how did you get into art, which is really uh, your passion? And, and, and it's a very early stay, uh, age, if I remember correctly. So I'm not sure if there was a watershed moment in my life that I can recall, Denny, but I was always interested in the arts. I think I grew up in a home which had a fair amount of art. My parents were collectors, except they collected a different kind of art that I enjoy today. And I think partly it was also the education I got and in the school I went to. We had a very nice art school over there. And it was um, a lot of happy coincidences, which led me to meet with some of the very senior artists of the day. And it was they who took me in as 
uh, you know, they came on as mentors and guided me, introducing me to fellow artists. And it wasn't just painters. It was painters to start with. I mean, the great MF Hussain. I remember I met him when I was about 15 and we became friends and he would come and stay with us whenever he was visiting Calcutta. On a, on a number of occasions, he's done that. There were very, uh, very many other artists who would do the same thing. And then it extended on to design, to textile, to jewelry, to photography. So I was very fortunate to have some of the best in the country who became literally my gurus and showed me the way forward. And I was young, impressionable, and I was just soaking it in as a sponge. And before one knew it, one got sucked into this area because it just opens a different world. I mean, in India, the arts is really not perceived to be so important because there are so many other pressing problems. But, you know, it's changed my life completely. And I only felt it was the right thing to do, to do something in this space and give back. You know, I had a session, I was trying to remember how he put it, Mish'al Kanu, a prominent family from Dubai, and we spoke about collecting and art. He's a big collector as well. And uh, he, he, he nicely described the differences between different types of, of collectors, right? When he said some people, uh, you know, are traders, they're making money from this. Some people um, uh, collect to show off, you know, to do their exhibitions and to show, look, uh, I got art. And he says uh, collectors uh, like himself, you know, they like to just know that they have it to see the every day when they wake up in the morning. So uh, uh, it's something that they're passionate about and, 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 and it just excites them. So how would you feel <coughs> yourself? Is that, is that something that, uh, that really makes you, makes you excited to look every morning at, at your own collection? And um. I think the way I collected and what it did to me was different earlier and it's different now. Uh, right in the beginning, Danny, if I bought a work, I would possibly, you know, hang it in my room and look at that, sit in front of that for maybe half an hour and take it in. But I don't think I've done that in the last 20 years with any piece of work because uh, A, one just doesn't have that luxury of time and B, one knows what one is looking for, it was much more of a discovery earlier. I think today I'm collecting not so much as a collector, but collecting really for the museum and what's important as a gap in the collection or as a story to tell. I think the responsibility when you're doing something which is in the public domain is very different from how you look at it when you were buying for yourself. And, uh, and how do you decide what you invest in? What are the power matters? What are the, what exactly are you, are, are, you, are you seeking when you decide? I'm not sure that I've ever in the past looked at art as an investment. It, it wasn't an investment when I was buying it because it really wasn't costing very much money. Uh, my contemporaries and my friends would spend the same amount of money on clothes and shoes, which I would be spending on art. So you can imagine that this was very, very affordable. It's only the passage of time that has made this valuable. And um, maybe I was fortunate and I had the good sense or the good guidance to pick up the right stuff, which became valuable later. So I can't really say I'd bought art as an investment. And um, one doesn't necessarily pick up something because one knows it's gonna go up in value. You go for it because you really like it and it speaks to you in a certain way. Um, and, um... When and uh, how did the idea for the museum came from? Because basically this is what you're spending a fortune and your time on and your passion. Uh, how did that happen? So Denny, it was uh, many historians and curators from museums around the world would come because they had heard about the collection or about a certain piece in the collection from a fellow artist or a fellow curator and they would ask to see it. And very often they would even ask to borrow it for an exhibition in their museum. And we would happily loan it. And uh, it used to bother me that why aren't museums in India interested in this stuff? And why is it only the West which is interested? And um, then the conversation started going towards 
Abhishek, what are you going to do with this collection later on? And I would always say that, you know, I'm just a custodian. This is going to go eventually to a museum. And many of these museums, which were borrowing stuff from us, would say, would you consider donating it to our museum? And I said, you know, I'm not sure I want this stuff to leave the country. If you would open a branch in India, you can have my collection. But I don't think anybody was ready to open a branch in India. And I'm talking 15, 18 years ago. So maybe something around that was when I realized that, you know, in India, we have some of the most crowded cities in the world, but we have the most empty museums. And the joke is, if you want to get away from people in India, you go to an Indian museum. And that's what we would like to change. Every time we would travel overseas, we would stand in queues for 45, 50 minutes or an hour to get into a popular museum and an exhibition. And here we had the most amazing art in our museums, but there was nobody interested in it. Not because the art was not good, but I think the entire museum experience wasn't good. And the emphasis has not been put on the right things in terms of outreach and education. So I think there were a number of these things which left an impression that something needs to be done here. And I think it was that that became the seed of an idea which later on germinated into a full-fledged scheme. Why is it like that? Why are museums empty in India? People don't care about art. What, what, what's, what's the scenery? scenery? So I think there are various factors, Jenny. One is um, most of the museums that I speak about are in the government sector. And many of these museums are a legacy of what the British left behind. Uh, they have now started being renovated and modernized, but many of them are literally relics of the past. Uh, the experience in there in terms of the lighting, the display, the signage, even the information about it, the cleanliness, it leaves much to be desired. And um, when you have the chance to visit a fantastic museum in London or New York or Paris, uh, and you compare that experience to this, uh, you wonder why should you even waste your time going here because they're not giving you what you're looking for. Today, a visit to the mall or to the movies comes far above in terms of preference to visiting a museum. Uh, many of them don't even do temporary exhibitions or changing shows. So you also feel it's something that you do once in a lifetime because you've seen it, but not something that you would constantly engage with. Uh, the other thing is, I think, you know, it's only now that India is really coming of age and becoming uh, up to date with the rest of the world in so many other respects and even overtaking the world in so many respects. Uh, and when you looked at the other list of priorities that India had, whether it was healthcare, education, hunger, clean water, so many other things, they would all naturally take precedence over the arts. Uh, plus, there has been a slightly elitist angle that museums suffer from in India. That is it more for the collectors and the intellectuals and the academics only, because it had a perceived notion of value rather than just creativity and art. And I think these are the things that we are trying to tackle in the museum that we are building in MAP. To speak to the average Indian and not just to the rich elite Indian, uh, which was exactly the problem why our existing museums have not lived up to their role as much as they should have. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about the journey here. Um... Um, <coughs> better the museum, the idea, is it operational? What's what it's all about? So um, it started off actually as an idea, something that I wanted to do. The very initial thought was, I don't know if I can do this by myself. So why don't we get a bunch of collectors together and do a collector's museum so that we can all contribute a certain percentage of our collection and make this museum happen? Um, I did speak to a bunch of collectors, and this time talking over a 10, 12 year journey into this. And some of them were excited, whereas others were more concerned about who the collection or who the museum is going to be named after. Some were even concerned as to which city it would be situated in and why not the city that they come from, 
And we were, of course, looking at collectors from across the country. When that plan didn't go through, um, I skirted with the thought of doing it by myself, but I'm not sure I knew what it took to build a museum. And just then there was an opportunity when the government of Karnataka had asked me if we could do it together and do it as a public-private partnership, as a PPP model. And that went further somewhat. And we even in fact signed an agreement because they made a policy. There were many properties up for adoption in Karnataka, which the government was willing to partner and a private entity or an enterprise or an individual could adopt one of those and run that. And under that, oh, we, there were three museums in Bangalore, which three, well, I mean, people all well known to each other decided to do, and one of them was ours. But that was a rather short-lived dream uh, because uh, there were certain, um, what should I say, misgivings or feelings of uh, when the private enterprise and government gets together in India, it's not always been for the public interest. Sometimes there has been vested interest there and that's what some people were suspecting. So, you know, when things weren't really going the way we expected it to, and we realized working with the government is not going to be so easy, we decided to do it on our own. And that's when the journey of MAP as we see it today began, which was about five years ago. Um, to tell you a little bit more, it was a small project when it was with the government because they were giving the land and the building and uh, all that money was being put in by the family. When it became a project to do by ourselves, it meant even buying a piece of land in the center of town and building a building from scratch. And I don't know if you know, but real estate in India, especially central CBD real estate in India is very expensive. And I didn't know that I could afford this project. It became about six times the budget that we were doing when it was with the government. But the family stepped up to the uh, occasion. We put in the leadership gift of 50% of the entire project cost. And we got the other 50% from different founding patrons who came to support it with donations. And uh, simultaneously, we also set up a US foundation and got our 501c3 over there. The reason was that in the US, people understand philanthropy and they understand philanthropy in the arts. Museums there are, except for the Smithsonian, is pretty much all run by private philanthropy. So it's not a new concept to them. I mean, the concept of giving to the arts has barely existed in India. And it's very evident from two factors. If you look at corporate social responsibility, where 2% of all corporate profits are supposed to go into a charity, less than 1% of that goes towards art, culture, and heritage. And this is that section of society, which is the most affluent, the most educated, and the most exposed to the arts. So we really thought that if we start a movement or at least a foundation in the US, we would also be able to attract donations for the cause back in India because we won't have to convince people why the arts are important. And that's when the budget went haywire again because we needed an endowment. And um, we got started with the building. Things were going pretty well until COVID hit. We were to open the museum last year. That wasn't possible because of the strict lockdowns that India had. And I think we'll only end up opening the museum next year. But what we did was a digital launch of the museum. And this was done in December last year and it possibly became the first museum in this part of the world to do a digital launch. And your family was, you said that eventually they supported you. W wasn't there a part where they told you, why do we need this adventure right now? I mean, so much, to invest time, fortune, you know, maybe find a different hobby. Uh, <laughs> I don't think anybody told me that. Partly maybe they know I make explosives, partly they indulged, partly they kept quiet, and partly they also knew how serious I was about doing it. So um, at least I haven't heard that from anybody in the family. And I was also conscious, Denny, that to raise the initial 
part of the money, we actually auctioned some of the paintings that I had bought, when, which is what I bought when I was in school, to raise the money to buy the land. And I was conscious to not sell a single work that any other member of the family had bought. Not that anybody would have said anything, but uh, it was just not something that I wanted to do. And uh, Abhishek, why MAP, M-A-P? That's the name of the museum, right? Am I correct? Yeah, it's the Museum of Art and Photography or MAP. We really, um, we toyed with lots of names and we wanted an acronym which was zippy and something that would stick and something that had a meaning. And I think the entire uh, thing about MAP is a journey. And um, it was almost as if MAP becomes this labyrinth where you can make your own journey, you can find your own journey. And the way we divided the collections was in six different silos and uh, getting these silos to speak to each other and every curator, everybody who comes in would make their own journey. And uh, we could just use the word map in various ways. So in fact, it was the acronym that came first because we knew M had to be there somewhere for a museum. And art was definitely something that was needed. We didn't know what the P would stand for. And because photography was a large part of the collection, we called it map. <laughs> and you went, uh, from buying to collect, which is uh, uh, one one thing, right? You're investing a lot. You're collecting. It's yours. It's in. You enjoy it. It's it's you know part of uh, what what you have, and now you're giving it away. Um, how does that feel? I mean, all the work you've been putting into this, all the, the the money, all the going to look for the pieces of art, all of that, you just give away now. You know, Denny. Um... When I started collecting, I had the good fortune of not just becoming friends with the artists, but some of the senior collectors and some collectors who were 40 years my senior, 50 years my senior. I mean, let's not forget, I started when I was in my teens. And uh, many of them in their late 60s and 70s would talk about doing something with their collection and making a museum. And I I recall this conversation with two of them and both were in the 70s and I must have been in my early 20s. And I said, why the hell did you wait until now to do anything? Why didn't you do it when you were 50? And uh, they said, okay, but we didn't do it then. We were busy doing work and stuff. And I said, imagine if you did it when you were 50, you could have enjoyed your own museum for 25 years. Now you don't have the energy. You don't have that much life left in front of you. And if you do something, you might even compromise the way you do it just because you're going to be in a hurry to do it. So something about that even stuck in my mind that I must do it when it's the right time rather than waiting when I have nothing else to do. Uh, many people make a museum for a legacy to leave behind. I think I'm making my museum that I can enjoy it along with everybody else. Interesting. Um, and um, uh, you still collecting? I mean, I mean, you'll still keep on buying pieces of art and then they will go to the museum, they will go to your house, they will go both. I mean, I guess the passion of collecting and finding the art, which is part of the, part of the game really, you know? So just uh, collecting, it's finding the treasures and things that, that excite you, I, I, I think, I'm guessing here. Um, uh, will you keep on collecting? And, you know, I think this is a disease that rarely leaves you and I'm yet to find a cure for it. <laughs> and uh, let me tell you, the person who will be the happiest if a cure is found would be my wife. And I hope she's not <laughs> hearing this conversation. Today. Well, I don't want to bring you my conversation because uh, that I've made with my wife, but uh, on a very different level, I've, uh, I'm a very big collector of Star Wars stuff from the 1970s that some of it is very hard to get. And uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't want to tell you the conversations I have with my wife that doesn't understand why, 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 basically. Um, but uh, I, you know, we have all these groups of weirdos where basically they're saying, my deal is that my wife doesn't ask me what I buy and I don't tell her how much it costs. And then we're good. So, um, and so now- I'll tell you something, which was uh, many years ago, 
Radhika, my wife, she said, you know, I've just had it. I cannot deal with any more packets coming into the house and more art to deal with. So she said, this is the last work of art coming to the house. And for many years, she thought I'd actually stop collecting art because I just moved a storage into the office. <laughs> and she had no idea that it would come there. It's just that the address changed. So what I do, well, we really come clean here. What I do is I go outside. I know they're coming at uh, 11.30 every time. I go outside and just quickly take them to the basement. And it's just me and my kids that know about it. And we keep it quiet, which probably I just ruined right now. If, 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 you know, if, if we think that our wives don't know, they know every bloody thing. <laughs> they do. Um, and then uh, um, uh, philanthropy. So you deal a lot with that. Uh, what does it mean to you? Why, what are you doing in that uh, regards? You know, I think philanthropy is too big a word because uh, uh, it's also a selfish act. And it's not, you know, in India, philanthropy means different things to different people. But I'll tell you what really moved me about something which I had heard when I was a kid, that the true act of philanthropy is where you don't have your name attached to it and you give it anonymously. And, um, you know, when you go to, and the, there was this temple I had been to, and it was the king who had built this temple maybe about five, 600 years ago. His name wasn't written anywhere, but his figure was made you know, in what we call doing namaskar, which is bowing down and literally prostrate on the floor. And everybody who walked into the temple would walk over him to go there. So it wasn't called the so-and-so, so-and-so temple. The temple was in the name of the God, not in the name of the king who did it. And he would say that, you know, I'm just a humble servant over here. I'm only the means through which this happens. Of course, philanthropy today is a lot about feeling good and making your name known and continuing your legacy. And I'm not saying one is good or one is bad. It's just different ways of looking at it. As long as you're doing good, whatever be the motivation, doesn't matter. But uh, when we were doing MAP, we decided that the family is not going to put its name anywhere as a donor or as a patron. It might come out in some way that, yes, Eventually the family had given it, but it's not going to be listed along with the patrons or listed along with the donors. Great. Um, and from being a major donor and patron uh, at the museum, uh, why have you kept your name, family name away from, uh, from, from the list? Well, you actually just uh, mentioned that uh, to me. Um, so you believe this is the right way to give and the museum is already there. It's operational. Is it still? No, it is only, I mean, the digital museum is operational. The physical museum would only start next year. But we are doing about uh, seven, eight, nine events every month. Uh, last week, we had Gilbert and George speaking with us. We have a masterclass once a month. We have videos. We have blogs. We have an exhibition all the time. We have uh, speakers, talks, webinars. So there's lots to engage for different age groups, including downloadable kits for children. And all this is happening online until we open physically. So, and when uh, we do open physically, the digital museum would continue to exist. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll give you a, a parallel. We did not know what a digital museum even meant because last year when COVID hit, of course in India, we thought that in one month, COVID is going to go away. Little did we realize that it would play out for so long and it's still not behind us. And um, if we had done a physical launch, we would have had 150 people in our auditorium. By doing a digital launch, we've had over 75,000 people who watched our opening. Now, even if I do build a physical museum, which will happen next year, why would I stop doing the digital museum, which can reach so many more people all over the world? So it'll be a hybrid, it'll continue to coexist. And I believe I've seen, uh, you, you showed me a little bit of uh, what you've done, which is incredible. S pieces of art where the artist that sometimes was long gone by now, 
is telling the children or whomever is listening the story behind the piece of art and how it's made and why it was made and what does it mean, right? Um, I remember correctly. That, that was the uh, digital twin of MF Hussein that you spoke with. And yes, he is an artist who's long gone. So Accenture did this because technology is a large part of what we do. So they brought him back to life as a digital twin, which anyone can interact with. And he replies back to you in his voice in real time. And you can see him making all the gestures while he speaks to you. And it's all the stuff that he's actually said. It's not made up. It's incredible. And I advise everybody to check it out. So um, some people ask here if this is going to be, uh, if, they, if they can watch uh, uh, the video recording. So we do record this session and everybody will get an email with the link to that. So if maybe you could send me uh, the link to share with everybody uh, so they can see the I'll, video. I'll do that immediately after this conversation. That would be great because I'm sure many, many people would like uh, to check it out um, and see what it's all about. And um, and, and you're, you're seeking any more support to your museum? Where, where yeah, are you with so, that? So we were looking at building our endowment last year, but I think COVID threw all that out of the window. And... Um, we are still at about 50% of the endowment we need to be. So yes, the uh, right now some conversations are happening again, but I guess all the corporates we were speaking to were so, um, you know, COVID just came and upset all plans because it was so much uncertainty that they didn't know how it's gonna pan out. I think with things returning to some sort of normalcy, these conversations would start, but, any support, however little it is, would be very, very helpful and go a long way to support this. As you've heard, it's not a priority in India, but the good part is of about the 40, 50 people who are supporting us, including corporates, individuals, and foundations, very, very few, less than five, seven percent of them have ever supported the arts before supporting MAP. That's incredible. So um, uh, I, I uh, as I've mentioned uh, earlier, uh, I, uh, I, I definitely hope to see you at our in-person conferences. And I think we, we spoke about the UAE one uh, that we'll be doing uh, early next year, uh, which of course we'll update everybody about. Um, and anything else uh, that you would like to add at this stage? I think uh, we built map on, um four main pillars, which we call care. It's conservation, accessibility, research, and education, uh, driven through technology wherever possible. We've been very fortunate, uh, Denny, this is, MAP is not something that I've done. I've only been a catalyst in this. I have to tell you my, my governing council, my board, my advisory panel, my international board in the US, my supporters, they have just been so supportive. A lot of what we've managed to do is thanks to the ideas they have come up with. I mean, today our team is 65 people and there are many firsts, not first because of technology, but a simple thing like we do not have a comprehensive encyclopedia of Indian art ever done in India. And MAP is putting together the very first one. We have 25 PhD students working towards that. Um, so, you know, it's got to do with how we connect with the community. How do we make art relevant? At the end of the day, this is not a vanity project. The idea is how can we find a solution to become relevant to all the government museums who are not doing as good a job as they can? And how can we make them better? Because they energy it takes to set up a museum is so big, but the learnings from that can be shared with everyone else and how the entire base can rise. So that's why we exist, how to make art exciting and uh, to arouse the curiosity in every child, to inspire every child and to literally turn STEM into STEAM. I think what you do is, uh, is, is of course very much in, in a very important thing and, and uh, we're very fortunate that people like you devote so much uh, to causes like that. So, um, so uh, good luck with everything you'll do there. 
Um, and uh, I would definitely uh, love to hear more uh, at our uh, in-person conferences where I hope uh, you'll be able to join and people could, could meet you in person and hear more about it. Um, and we will share, of course, the story um, uh, and the links to the museum for everybody here. Uh, you get, you're gonna get a, you, you will get an email by tomorrow, uh, 24 hours later. Um, so I would like to thank you so much. Thank you, Danny, for having today. me. And thank you, everyone, for listening in. Absolutely. And I would like to tell everybody tomorrow at 11 EST, my session is about hedged equity, about using short and long uh, volatility equity investments to create low correlated diversified portfolios with risk efficient returns. So very financial discussion tomorrow. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Abhishek. I'm looking forward to meeting you in person. Thank you, everybody. Stay safe. And we hope the world opens up very, very soon to everybody. Thank you. Thank Bye, you. Danny. Bye-bye. How do we join tomorrow's session? Somebody's asking. Um, poof, uh, uh, let me write you my email here and you can send me an email and we will send you the information. That's my email, danny at dcfinance.com. Very simple, danny at dc-finance.com. Just email me and I'll send you the information. And Abhishek will, will share with me uh, all the information regarding his museum uh, online is, and his initiatives. So uh, all of you can check it out uh, later on. Um, so again, thank you everybody for being here and we'll see you soon tomorrow. Bye. Thank you.